And so this talks about the lifestyles they have to deal with. The second part of the book, uh, Hooper from the Bebop side, uh, the first part dealt with uh, life aspects. And this part deals more with uh, kind of the sport in and of itself. Uh, racing hoops every day, and, and today's talk is drawn, actually drawn from this chapter, but it looks at how the young men have to negotiate or deal with issues of race uh, in the context of playing the sport of basketball, and then how their views about uh, race and sports. All right, the good and bad of sportsmanship looks at the contextual uh, uh, spaces in which the young men determine what is good and bad sportsmanship. So it analyzes, is an elbow a good thing? Is a punch, is fighting a good or bad thing? And then I talk about the context in which these are things are thought of as approved or appropriate behavior. Chapter 8, which is my favorite chapter, uh, in the heat of the battle, and it's essentially raw field notes of pre-game, game, and post-game activities. So that you will read descriptions of how players and coaches get into intense uh, competition with one another, shouting matches, the use of profanity, to talk to one another, uh, and if you were a spectator, you might assume that something else uh, was going on that was, more, that was deeper uh, going on there. But in fact, uh, once the game is terminated and we're outside of the lines, life is it's restored to a peaceful kind of a legal uh, situation. And then finally, the irony of a dirty trick, and essentially that trick is to teach the young men to have aspirations for uh, professional athletics, when in fact, all those involved, including parents, generally understand this might not be possible. And if you think about it, a good example to think about it is, I'm sure when, when some of you all were children, you might say, Mommy, I want to be a, a violinist. Or Daddy, I want to be a... And you know what Mommy and Daddy did, right? They went and got you the equipment. And you know, go, son, you can do it. And, and they knew all along, you know, this kid, he's got two left feet, or he, he can't play, or he can't hear a tune, or whatever. But they still encouraged you. So this is a process of encouraging uh, understanding clearly uh, that these young men may not have an opportunity. Uh, and the irony is that by uh, encouraging them in this way, they still have or meet with uh, mobility. You know, by getting the kid to focus on high school, he graduates high school instead of falling, you know, victim to drugs and so on and so forth. Okay? And then the appendix I deal with uh, theories in the air, and that's micro level theories. Uh, because I'm talking about life and sports, there are lots of theories that can be applied in a cross-cutting manner. And so uh, I talk about why did not select or settle down on one particular theory, but rather go with theories I call on the ground. And those that are grounded actually in uh, kind of the, the organic interactions that the people have. All right, and then finally I do a, what I call a reality check. Uh, I do reflexive ethnography. And that is a, a sense to see how you fit in as a researcher into the world that you're examining. And because I was a coach, I had a central role, and I talk about the dynamic of being a confidant, a teacher, uh, an interviewer, a researcher at the same time, and how all those roles play out, and what it is I actually find and discover. So that's the background um, on the book. All right, today's talk is, oh yes they can, young African American male athletes localized perceptions of athletic ability. Uh, the next picture you will see will be one that's somewhat embarrassing to me. But I'm putting it up here because it kind of shows the demographic of the team uh, that starts out as the background for the talk. Uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, and this is me here again. But notice we have one, two, three white athletes on the team. Over the three years that I played basketball for Aurora University, we never had more than four white players on our team. Yet they were key to our team's success. When they failed to perform in pivotal games, often against opponents whose players were predominantly African American, then my black teammates and I sought explanations rooted in stereotypes. An African American teammate of mine once said, Man, them white boys get scared every time we play a black team. I agreed, although I had little grounds upon which to evaluate his judgment of our scared white teammates. Maybe it was just a feeling we had. No doubt this feeling was rooted in our belief that African Americans were natural athletes and whites were not. We thought of our white teammates as crafty, intelligent, and skilled shooters, whereas we thought of ourselves as quicker, stronger, and more aggressive than them. How could we think otherwise? Everything we had been exposed to, including media representations of black athletes, 
told us we were better built for the game of basketball. Sometimes these explanations of black athletic superiority were laced with creative arguments about physiological makeup. Whether African Americans were indeed superior athletes or not, both us and our white teammates believed it to be true. Race did matter to us. Thus, it was easy for us to surmise that our white teammates became intimidated when faced with the prospect of competing against black players. We had learned that white men can't jump and that blacks were bred to be physically superior. For the men and young men involved in Northeast Knights, issues of race are very real. These issues run subtly through the core of the boys' and men's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Occasionally, however, the men and boys talk explicitly about the ways in which race impacts their lives. What follows is a sampling of the coaches' and players' discussions in which race was explicit. I examine the players' views of athletic ability at the nexus of race and social environment and how their views generally challenge conventional wisdom about race and athletic ability. The question is, what is the conventional uh, view of race and athletic ability? Uh, I'm sure if you asked around campus uh, in general, people would probably say that African Americans are natural athletes. This is the kind of view that was espoused by Jimmy the Greek Snyder. Uh, and recently, Larry Bird, the Hall of Famer, who said that uh, African Americans were natural athletes and the sport of basketball was their sport. Uh, and that's generally the conventional view of race and athletic ability. What do scholars say about race and athletic ability? The central role that notions of race play in how individuals view the world has been thoroughly examined in the scholarship of social scientists. Beyond social scientists' examinations of race for its social impact, scholars in the biological sciences have examined and debated the malleability of human differences based upon elastic biological categories of race. One arena in which social considerations and biological notions of race meet is within the area of sports. Indeed, the relationship between race and athletic ability has been the subject of much social commentary and is embedded in historical notions of racial difference. For instance, in 1997, John Hoberman's book, Darwin's Athletes, How Sport Has Damaged Black Americans Preserved the Myth of Race, created a stir in very scholarly circles. Hoberman examined long-standing and taboo questions about the relationship between race and athletic ability. Most notably, he was concerned with explaining why African Americans were disproportionately represented in major sports that emphasized athletic ability. And when we talk about athletic ability here, we're talking about uh, if a person was born without any particular training, that they would have some natural talent uh, over others with regard to speed. Uh, and you can think of track as one that stands out in your mind. Uh, and then agility, the balance and quickness and ability to uh, do reactive tasks. And then finally, leaping ability, exposure off the ground uh, to the basket uh, in this instance. For the sake of brevity, I have reduced Holman's main argument to two points relevant for this talk. First, contrary to the generally held social scientific notion of race as a social construction, Holman argues that there is a biological basis for race. Yet this biological basis is complicated by the imprecise ways we might define race. Second, Hoberman argues that Charles Darwin's biological determinism serves as the basis for much of the research conducted presently on race and athletic ability. Furthermore, that such an approach cannot be separated from the racist assumptions of the times. Hoberman states, it remains a cultural fact that Africans have a special place in the Western imagination as fantasy objects associated with physical vitality. And this makes them especially attractive to those in search of biological distinctions between the races. Tabloid science is dangerous because it can function as a potent carrier of pseudoscientific ideas about racial difference, feeding the appetite for such revelations, which is a major legacy of our racist past. So for Holman, the way we even approach studying race and athletic ability is grounded in these historical racial notions. Holman is most critical of Darwin's law of compensation and simply stated uh, bronze, uh, brains are, and brawn are inversely proportional, or the stronger one is, the less intellect one possesses. And I know if you were uh, a high school athlete or if you just were a high school student, you probably observed someone who would be considered the dumb jock. And so this is the kind of prototype uh, he's suggesting here. Hopeman is uh, 
Okay, in 2000, on the heels of uh, Darwin's athletes, John Entine released his book, Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate Sports and Why We're Afraid to Talk About It. Entine argues that black athletic superiority stems from both cultural and genetic forces. However, his point of departure from Holcomb's argument is that he believes that those athletes whose ancestry is tied to West Africans have a distinct natural advantage over athletes who do not have West African ancestry. Interestingly, both Entine and Hoberman use similar evidence to arrive at different conclusions. You see different citations there are, they share similar citations. Hoberman concludes that there is no athletic advantage for African Americans, while Entine concludes that African Americans have a biological advantage in athletic competition. Ah! Just to wake people up. Okay? <laughs> Although both arrive at different conclusions, both physically, <laughs> I teach 8 o'clock class in the morning, right? And so I'm used to sleepers and heavy lunches and, you know, whatever. Uh, although both arrive at different conclusions, both phys about physical ability, each author emphasizes that there is no correlation between race and inferior intelligence. Irrespective of what one concludes from the various evidence provided about the relationship between athletic ability and race, it is clear from both the scholarly and media responses to these books, that questions about race and athletic, superior athletic ability are key concerns for how many individuals think about race. So in this talk, uh, I want to ask the following questions. How do athletes themselves view the relationship between race and athletic ability? How might a specific context influence those perceptions? And what kind of theoretical explanations might be made for the players' perceptions? So we get to the nitty gritty of what the Knights are actually thinking about uh, competing uh, with regard to race and athletic ability. The conclusions drawn by those who make arguments about the physical superiority of black athletes have influenced the self-image of many young African American boys. The notion of black athletic superiority, coupled with the proliferation of successful black athletes, has conditioned many young men, in particular those individuals most disenfranchised from legitimate opportunity, to view sports as a viable means of escaping poverty. Furthermore, individuals who associate a certain natural athletic ability to a particular racial group are likely to evaluate their own ability based upon such stereotypes. These questions regarding how the Northeast Knights think about race and social environment as it relates to athletic <coughs> ability will help us evaluate the extent to which popular notions of black athletic superiority have permeated the boys' own self-conceptions as athletes. The extent to which Americans use race as a proxy for athletic ability cannot be understated. And if you think back to that exercise we did at the beginning, uh, I said a wide receiver on a professional football team, and I would guess that probably a lot of people thought of an African American. A star player on a professional basketball team, I would guess a lot of people thought of an African American. Uh, Olympic gold medalist in swimming, I would guess a lot of people thought of an African American. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then a member of a crew team at an Ivy League university, and that's clearly an African American. <laughs> no, we understand we have this conceptualization of where people fit based upon race and athletic ability. The black athlete is viewed by many as a superior athlete to other athletes. The overrepresentation of blacks in sports and events that require uh, what many consider the most important athletic attributes uh, reinforces the notion of black males as natural athletes. The high representation of African Americans in professional basketball and at the positions requiring attributes like speed in football impresses upon many the legitimacy of the natural black athlete. These frames of understanding have a subtle place in the minds of the Northeast Knights. For instance, in the following field note, Mr. Thompson, a father of two of our former players who acted as a conditioning coach over two seasons, questions the player's commitment to athletic success. Beyond his questions about desire for athletic success, he invokes as part of the equation, what I like to say, uh, race, clearly, as part of the equation. Specifically, he questions the players' ability and desire vis-a-vis -vis white athletes. I was waiting in the vestibule with BT, Turo, David, and Pudicat. The guys were unwinding after riding all the way home from Nimrod County with little discussion. We'd been unexpectedly beaten by Nimrod. We had the more talented team, but did not play well enough to win. Mr. Thompson said, uh, 
It don't bother y'all to get y'all ass whipped. He was obviously upset. All the players standing around me said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Thompson said to Truro, and this is the team captain, uh, I thought you said your senior class was different. And he was referring to the fact that each senior class always said, we're going to be better than the team before us. Truro said, it's, it's still early in the season. Mr. Thompson said, why don't you do something to make the season better? Why don't you have yourself in shooting practice tomorrow at 7 a.m.? I can't understand it. The guys who are shooting half the shots are not even coming to shooting practice. You need to come to shooting practice. Will you be in shooting practice tomorrow? Truro didn't say anything. Mr. Thompson said, you need to have your ass in practice. Truro still didn't respond. Mr. Thompson was becoming more angry as he began to realize the promise that we had failed to achieve. He asked the players, are y'all scared? No, they replied in unison. Mr. Thompson said, y'all, y'all get scared of playing in white boys just like you did in football. What white boys, Truro asked? The ones that beat y'all ass, Mr. Thompson said. Although Mr. Thompson questions the general commitment of the players, his use of the phrase, y'all scared of playing in white boys, greatly shifts the emphasis of his critique of the players' efforts. By invoking race as a contributing factor to the players' poor performance, Mr. Thompson is calling into question not only the players' commitment, but their ability to, fa to face competition from whites. The insult in this, this, in this statement is grounded in a taking for granted understanding of many that white athletes are less capable than black athletes. Thompson assumes that the stereotypical ability of black athletes in and of itself should bolster the players' confidence when competing against predominantly white teams. Thompson's criticism of the Knights' performance vis-a-vis -vis white athletes raises an interesting question. Do the young men themselves believe race to be a determining factor as to athletic ability? During the interviews with the young men, I posed this question and an interrelated one. The first question was, does where an individual grows up determine whether they will be a good athlete? This question attempts to explore the young men's understanding of the social processes involved in developing an individual's athletic ability. Their responses to this question were often related to the neighborhood's social conditions they reflect social class. The second question was, does one's race matter as to whether an individual will be a good athlete? This question attempts to understand the extent to which the young men emphasize race as key to athletic ability. Although these two questions were presented as distinct considerations, the players' responses were very much interrelated, given the fact that their neighborhood experience is also an exclusively African-American experience. Thus, it is rare for the young men to assess whites' ability prior to their own interracial competition, which occurs during middle school between the ages of 11 and 14. So let's look at it. What do they think about race uh, and social environment? How, does, how much does social environment impact your ability to become a good athlete, or what I like to call the hood effect? In general, the players believe that one's neighborhood has some influence on becoming a good athlete, while one's race has little to do with the potential for an individual to become a good athlete. Still, the young men have nuanced perceptions of the impact of race and neighborhood on becoming a good athlete. Because the players' comments are not in sight to, I mean, that is, their comments are not made while they're in direct competition with whites, one must consider the cross-cutting context within which the players make their assessments uh, of the relationship between social environment race, and athletic ability. For instance, Danny Newell, a frequently used substitute, shared the following in an interview. I said, does where you come from have anything to do with whether you're a good athlete or not? Like, where you live, where you grow up? Danny, uh, no, uh, well, it's got something to do with it, but just because you are from there, you know, don't mean you're actually going to be a good. I said, like, what do you mean uh, you said it has something to do with it? Danny, like, like, if somebody, like in your neighborhood, if everybody playing basketball, you're going to get up and you're going to go want to play too. So you're going to do what's around you. And this is one of the reasons why Coach Benson does not have these cuts, because the things that are around these young men are not very pivotal. I said, well, does your race matter about whether you'll be a good athlete or not? Then, no. Nah. I said, no? Nah, you don't think so? No, Danny says. For Danny, the social setting in which one grows up impacts the frequency with which one is exposed to certain activities. 
In this case, basketball is a prominent activity for the young man in his neighborhood. When his peers play, daddy plays. He is therefore able to refine his skill as a player who can shoot and to maximize his own athletic ability through constant training. On the other hand, Danny suggests that race has no impact on whether one becomes a good athlete. His belief is no doubt influenced by the fact that Danny played against white players during his time at Northeast High School and had an opportunity to witness that some of these white players were both skilled and outstanding athletes. For instance, uh, when we played North Farmington during Danny's senior year, two of the early baskets of the game for North Farmington were scored when one of their players slam dunked the basketball. Now, North Far Farmington is an all-white team. <clears throat> Later in the same game, the North Farmington team combined for two alley-oop slam dunks. Uh, and these are probably considered the most athletic moves you can make in basketball. The slam dunks in this game were defining moments of white male athletic ability for some of our players and a secondary affirmation for others who had already become aware that white men can jump. So here we have the social environment kind of impacts, uh, the perception impacts uh, whether you become a uh, good athlete or not. But then you have this notion of race. And the question becomes, uh, is race uh, uh, a factor as to whether one becomes a good athlete? Is it hard work in a social environment or is it race? The players believe that race has little to do with an individual's desire to work at being successful. And I should say that 16 of the 18 players uh, suggested that race was not a factor. And that's a major consideration. Rather, the players uh, generally believe that any individual who has achieved success as an athlete has had the drive, work ethic, and talent to achieve. The players' understandings of the relationship between hard work, social environment, and natural talent demonstrates a certain level of awareness. For this reason, many of the players are able to accept as a possibility the notion of naturally talented white athletes. Lionel, a starting uh, starter during his senior year, gives the following example. I said, do you think somebody's race has anything to do with whether they're considered a good athlete or not? Lionel, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, it's all on them. I mean, they say white boys can't jump, but I've seen some white boys that can jump. And I start laughing at him when he says that. Uh, I said, name one. Who was that? Lionel. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, my freshman year in high school, this white boy named John. This, this is when uh, Dee Benson was down here. Uh, he was playing on the varsity, but he didn't play because he had to transfer to Queens High School, which is a private white high school. Because he was like, uh, he was going to get some time. Boy, John, he could jump. He was about 6'1", 6'2". He was going to be Dee Benson's backup point guard. Man, that white boy could jump. <laughs> Lionel makes a statement, it's all on them to suggest two aspects of athletic ability. One aspect is the natural talent of an individual, the extent to which the individual is born with a certain uh, ability. The second is that individuals must take the time to develop that ability. Thus, it is on them as to whether they become what they have the promise to become. In this case, John, the white male athlete to which Lionel refers, was successful at developing his basketball talent and skill. Initially, I was surprised by Lionel's remarks that he believed white men could jump. When I asked him to name a player, my question was partly rhetorical and partly in jest. Since we only had one white player on the Northeast Knights during the time that, I, uh, that Lionel played, I believe it would be difficult for Lionel to name one. To my surprise, he identified John. Perhaps if Lionel had not remembered John, he still could have easily made reference to white players like those from North Farmington who would prove accurate examples of white males who were excellent athletes. Although to some observers, the players might seem to exhibit a naivete regarding physiological differences between individuals and across groups, the players exhibit an understanding of the complex ways in which natural ability and nurturing of that ability are interrelated. While most players reject the notion that certain races are more likely to be good athletes than others, Tommy Colt has a different take on the role of race in determining an athlete's abilities. Tommy's background is worth mentioning since it is different from the typical young man who competes for the Northeast Knights. Perhaps it is Tommy's middle class family background that gives him a view which is more consistent with conventional wisdom about race and athletic ability. Tommy and his brother David are the only two uh, young men interviewed who stated definitively that race is significant as to whether a player will be considered a good athlete. They have lived with both parents since they were born and their father played professional football 
for a few years. Tommy grew up playing sports at the recreation center and learned his athletic ability at an early age. By high school, not only did Tommy's basketball teammates recognize him as an excellent athlete, but his senior class at Northeast High School voted him most athletic. Both Tommy and David experienced post-high school athletic success, and each one of these athletes went on to uh, play Division I football. In the interview, Tommy provided the following view of race, genes, and social environment. I said, do you think where you live or where you grew up has anything to do with whether you're going to be a good athlete or not? Tommy said, no, nah, not really. Because like, when I first started playing, I was told uh, that people from like East Ridge would be better than people from Cedarton. You know, because they were horror or whatever. You know, but I was just like, Psh. and I said, they didn't know you, huh, Tommy? No, Tommy said. I said, you think race has anything to do with whether somebody's a good athlete or not? Tommy, no, not necessarily. It's just like some of it you get from like just genes or whatever. Just being like a pure athlete, I think that's just genes pretty much. I asked you think particular races have a better or more of a chance of being pure athletes than other races? Tommy, yeah. I said, like, like, so if you compare Asians and whites, and we both back this comparison, if you compare Asians and whites, you might say that Asians would be better players or better pure athletes than whites. Tommy said, no, no, I'd probably say it the other way around. I said, yeah, what about blacks and whites? Tommy said, I would say probably blacks. While Tommy has suggested that members of particular racial groups, for instance, whites, are better athletes than those from other racial groups, for instance, Asians, he is also aware that genes across racial groups are an important determinant as to whether an individual will be a pure athlete. It is conceivable, given what Tommy has indicated, that individuals from various racial groups who are good athletes will have been born of parents who also were genetically more athletic than average members of that racial group. Thus, those African Americans who are pure athletes are born of parents who are also athletes, whereas those African Americans who do not demonstrate athletic talent or not pass the genetic makeup to be pure athletes. And I consider myself as, uh, as an African American in that category. Um, I'm okay, but I'm not that pure athlete you might think of. Interestingly, Tommy demonstrates a keen understanding of the accepted racial hierarchy with regard to those athletes most frequently categorized as superior. His ranking of blacks over whites and whites over Asians reflects social hierarchies as they are understood generally. Perhaps his understanding of the politics of race and sports is grounded in the fact that his father was an excellent athlete through high school, college, and professional ranks. It is likely that once Tommy had been identified as the son of Fulton Colt, coaches, parents, and peers began dubbing him a natural athlete because his father had been a successful athlete. So now we get to the home stretch between uh, uh, race and social environment and try to bring it all together. Given the fact that so many of the players rarely suggested racial group membership as a positive or negative indicator of athletic success, what might we have learned about the players' understanding of the relationship between race, social environment, and, and athletic ability? John Entine, Arthur Taboo, observes that to most people who follow sports, it is clear that blacks are superior athletes and that this superiority is related to race and genes. If we accept Anton's observation, then the Northeast Knights evaluation of white athletes in comparison to black athletes is an anomaly. This raises the question, is there anything about the young men's experience at Northeast that inhibits them from identifying similar stereotypes about African American males, athletic ability vis-a-vis -vis white males within their own competitive environment? Indeed, this is an interesting question, especially given the fact that these young men are cognizant of the significance of race in other areas of their lives. I suggest the following three possible theoretical explanations for the players' perceptions about race and athletic superiority. First, the players interact with white athletes who share skills and abilities comparable to their own. Second, the players have had limited exposure to structural factors that raise racial distinctions to greater salience. And third, the players have embraced a sense of meritocracy within their own athletic setting. The first explanation suggests that since the Knights do not compete at the elite level of high school basketball, they are exposed to white athletes who share comparable skills and abilities as their own. Specifically, Northeast high school players compete within a general pool of athletic talent 
where the subtle distinctions that make an athlete great are not presented or yet identified. When the Knights, when the Knights compete against teams from North Farmington, Nimrod County, and Wilmington County, they are for the most part competing against white athletes who are good but not great. Given the players' own limited abilities and that of their white counterparts, the players may conclude that white males are as athletic as black males. The players are therefore evaluating athletic ability associated with race from the standpoint of their own participation and not the grand scale used in general to evaluate elite athletes. The second explanation is that although the Northeast Knights attend a racially mixed school, their limited interaction with whites uh, within the school context does not permit them to assess the magnitude to which race plays out in broader society. Beyond their awareness that some whites might call them nigger and that there are limits on the level of association that they may have with whites, the players, like other African Americans at Northeast, have not been exposed to the fullness of racial tension that experience grants. As teenagers, the players are in an idealistic stage of life, a stage in which race should not matter. It is only after experiences that move beyond high school that players might begin to get a sense of the complicated and pervasive nature of race within American culture. Thus, as the players make the transition into adulthood, one might expect that they might modify their beliefs about race to include the notion of a superior uh, black athlete. Finally, the players uh, have a belief in meritocracy, which stems uh, from their life stage idealism. They embrace the notion of equal opportunity. Their perceptions of the unlimited potential to become whatever one wishes are deeply entrenched in their minds, so too is the individualization of failure, that is, you fail because you couldn't make it. The player's posture toward opportunity is embedded within the context of their own participation in basketball at Northeast High School. Members of the Knights team come to understand that the coaches are constantly evaluating individual players and that those individuals who work hard and demonstrate ability are given the opportunity to play. It is this belief that keeps players thinking uh, even those who consistently have been marginal participants, quote, I know I'm going to get my chance one day. The player's reliance upon meritocracy is predictable, given Coach Benson's articulated belief that every player should be given an opportunity to perform. As the players see structural opportunities in practice, they come to perceive that those who are the best will indeed have the opportunity to demonstrate that ability. And for those of you all who will sleep, you can wake up now. Conclusion. <laughs> In conclusion, the young men of Northeast have demonstrated again the importance of context for defining macro level understandings. In context like that of the Northeast Knights, when it is said that white men can't jump, the response would be a resounding, oh yes they can. Thank you. This is my favorite part now. <laughs> Any questions? Is that you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> short, sir. Short. short. Uh, indicative of the 80s. Um, I'll ask a question. I, I came in a little late, so I apologize for asking something that you, you uh, mentioned earlier in your talk. But can you give me a, a little sense, uh, a little bit more sense of the context of Northeast Knights in terms of, um, I guess, where they're located? And I, I guess what I'm, what I'm curious about is, um, in the course of your interviews, what you got a sense that, um, or, or rather, what your, your sense was of the role that race played in their identity, you know, the, the players themselves. Because it, it seems to me that, particularly in, in the current context with, you know, sort of the emergence of hip-hop and the, and the merger between hip-hop and professional sports, and these, these major figures that often race is signified in very interesting ways, um, particularly among the top athletes. And I'm just curious as to whether or not they compared themselves in any way, saw them as role models, or, or thought of their racial identity vis-a-vis -vis those, those particular characters, and how that factored into their notions of racial difference and, and athletic ability. Uh, uh, I will say that uh, the Northeast Knights are located in a uh, predominantly African-American area okay. with three to four uh, housing projects right around okay. high school. 55% uh, African-American, 50% white, 7% okay. you know, Hispanic. So it's a very segregated space. The team is predominantly African-American. Uh, the coaches are African-American. And most of the blacks that play on the team come from low-income areas. And that's why those two gentlemen that I gave are standout examples. 
uh, with regard to notions of race in general. Uh, it is clear uh, from interviews and from even my own just observation that they have an identity which is consistent with uh, uh, with kind of this popular notion of being uh, an African American athlete. And I'll give you an example just by simply stating their favorite athletes are Allen Iverson, right. for example, who represents all violations of, you know, kind of normal standards with sure. regard to authority. Sure. Uh, in fact, when we watch video, some players who might do a move that's similar to Allen Iverson would say, God, 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 Iverson, and you know, like he is, you know, Allen Iverson. Uh, they have cornrows, do rags, I mean, the whole world. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of these young men didn't have, uh, you know, we, we'd say we're going to wear ties, shirts and ties. Uh, they would not have shirts or ties. I brought some shirts from home. So, shirts and ties, but they would have a $200 jersey. Right. Okay, so this is a, this is a mm -hmm. typical kind of pop culture belief in African American sure. identity, and this is the representation of mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so that's why it was interesting even then to hear mm -hmm. how they talked about, you know, you know competition. I don't recall a time when uh, a head coach ever made reference to uh, a team that defeated us with regard to race. Mm. It was always his, his, his point of emphasis was always, always his disappointment with the players' inability to do what they were capable of doing, mm. rather than, you know, this team is no good because of yeah. their race. Yeah. So, yeah, they definitely had that same that pop culture. In fact, I talk about this in Chapter 9, that... Uh, you know, a, a parallel to this being an athlete and these aspirations to be an athlete is to be an entertainer, mm -hmm. okay? Not just any entertainer, but a hip-hop entertainer. Mm -hmm. And what you have, I have actually have uh, radio quality CDs produced by four or five of the guys that played on the team over the time I've been there. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, they're thinking, yeah. man, I'm going to break this thing, I'm going to be big one day, and then, you know, and the odds are very, very much against that. So it's consistent with those same kind of uh, cultural icons and so on and so forth. Yeah, I want to follow up on Darnell's question. Um, were there racial differences in terms of the style of play? Uh, you know, because traditionally there's black ball and white ball. Or are, do, do, do all white high school kids also want to play what we used to think of as black style? Yeah. Uh, do, do, do they create identity in, in terms of, of, of the style of play? Uh, well, that's, that's center, that typically those things flow from a coach. Yeah. You know, or what coaches permit and what they do not permit. Uh, the team was, our team was a pressing team, which is up tempo, use your athletic ability, go wild, you know, do everything that's, you know, behind the back dribble. All those things were a part of what we did as a scheme, as a system. In fact, I said we dressed 28 players. I mean, we dressed 22 players and they rotated the last five rotated uniforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would play five at a time. I remember one game we played 22 players in the first quarter. Hmm. You know, so you can imagine, it's just, you know, as, as much, it's a structure, but not a lot of structure. Now, some of the teams we played, uh, they played a more deliberate style. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there was this white boy, you know, you know, black boy basketball, stylistic points. But for the most part, those teams were also competitive in a way that we respected uh, as a team. Uh, stylistically, you know, even the head coach would not permit, some kid came in there one day where he had a red socks because the team comes with red and gold, and he had them up to here. And he was a mom. Mom, he said, oh, man, man, we're not going to have that shit right there. Take them, you know, take them socks off. So that you can do some things within the context of the sport that, you know, make you feel comfortable as a player. Mm -hmm. But certain styles and things like pants hanging down and all that, yeah, pull them up, you know. And then we went up here and bought extra long pants so they didn't look like me, you know, with the tight 80s pants yeah. on. Yeah, uh, but stylistically, very similar uh, uh, styles between the teams, and some teams didn't have the same styles. But mm -hmm. yeah. one of the places where I think our kind of concept of race and athleticism is coming under stress, anyway, is the rise of black quarterbacks in the mm -hmm. National Football um, League. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because I mean, if you watch football, you really notice it. But on the one hand, do you think it's this real change? On the yeah. other hand, the quarterbacks are described as athletic, yeah. and you know, yeah, my student, uh, Daniel Buffington, just uh, had an article published in the Sociology of Sport Journal. And what he did was a content analysis of the kinds of statements made over, uh, I guess, uh, one season 
probably about five years ago when they had uh, some Dominic Nav, uh, Culpepper, uh, who was the other one? Uh, King. Sean King. Yeah, Sean King. Uh, the one for the Titans. Uh, I mean, man. Yeah. Yeah, so he had these, you know, five. And what he found was that typically, while there was representation of uh, African Americans at that position, that they were also characterized as those athletic uh, individuals through his, his analysis of the commentary, descriptions that, that dealt more with physical ability versus the intellect responsible for dictating and organizing and running a team. But what about this dimension of power? I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of smart and there's athletic, but there's also power. Quarterbacks, coaches, they're in these power positions and that's really racialized. Do your high school students see that ahead of them? You know, do they? I'm not, I'm not sure that I had a context for understanding that. I will say that at the University of Georgia, for the last four years, you know, they finished in the top ten in football or whatever. And we had a quarterback named David Green, mm -hmm. white guy. He was in my class, mm -hmm. okay? So I had David Green in the class, and I used to ask him questions about comparing him and his backup quarterback, DJ Shockley, uh, who was also a, a wonderful athlete uh, and a uh, heralded person. And I would ask questions, he said, well, we're different, you know, and, you, you know, just he'll get a chance and he'll do a fine job, is what he would say. This year I had DJ Shockley in class, and so I asked him, well, you know, how, how did you feel about sitting behind Green, you know, all the time? He said, well, I think that I learned a lot uh, that the things that I saw him go through were helping me with my career, my last years. I said, well, do you know you don't get a lot of shit about being a, a black athlete when you make a mistake? Because they were a lot more patient with David Green, mm -hmm. you know, than I think it would be with DJ Shockley. And it goes to that notion of can they lead? And I had a lineman in class who played with both Green and Shockley, and the lineman said, what it is that people need to understand is both uh, David and DJ command respect in the huddle, and that it's about leading your team. And we both we have confidence in those players. So as an anecdote, you can see that the team must have you know be responsive to that leadership ability. Uh, and for that particular individual, the white lineman, in that context, he accepted that. Mm -hmm. And so that you know that's just anecdotal. I imagine that you have to do it's almost you have to do this thing called John Henryism uh, among African Americans where we feel like we got to do twice as much to prove that we are as adequate as anyone else. And so I imagine that DJ may feel that pressure. And he said he wasn't going to change anything he done, had done to prepare. So that, um, yes, maybe so, but at the same time, there's a feeling maybe among those who are McNabb and so on that we have to represent as African Americans and do more to kind of garner the, the minimal support that everyone else would have. So I don't think that young men, I don't have a context for understanding how they saw that. In fact, their, their life orientation was so day to day, it was scary. You know, it was scary. As a sociologist, you see this. And then when I first got there, and the kids were going, you know, got dribbling the ball like this, you know, something like that, and said, you know, Coach May, Coach May, uh, what do I need to do to play on the next level? And I, like, turned my head down, like, shit, you got no chance. But, you know, and then I said, oh, you know, just keep working hard. And after a while, I realized what they were really seeking was someone to give them something to think, to aspire to, you know? And so, uh, you know, after a while, I began to say, okay, well, you need to work on a jump shot. You need to spend, and I would spend a little time with guys after practice that didn't really have a chance to do anything. But it was, it was, it gave them something else to focus on. So that they had a better orientation than just the day-to-day -day orientation that you might expect. Um, my question is pertaining to athleticism mm -hmm. versus hard work and uh, desire. Get up on the board, because mm -hmm. I think oftentimes, but well, especially in basketball, it's not necessarily how athletic you are. Um, I think it more so has to do with your desire and, and work ethic. Larry Bird was slow, couldn't move, could barely jump over a phone book, but he used to eat people alive because he had his his aptitude for the game was mm -hmm. was way over the guys mm -hmm. that he would play against. One game I remember quite vividly was the NBA playoffs in 1987 when the Celtics would play the Atlanta Hawks. And he had a guard, Dominique. And everybody, everybody in Atlanta in the Omni knew the Bird was going to do a turnaround and jump shot. And he had Dominique who had like a 40-some inch vertical, but he couldn't stop it. And every time he catched the ball in the corner, 
He turned that slow turning face and just fired it. And there was nothing but net the whole time. And it ended up they were going like back and forth, back and forth, and even the commentators were saying, How is this guy, how is this slow white guy from Indiana is able to put this jump shot in Dominic Wilkinson's face like this for this often of time? Yeah. And years later after he retired, he went on to say, uh, I think Charles Barkley asked him from TNT, mm -hmm. how was he able to play against guys like Dominique, then later Michael Jordan and those guys, mm -hmm. and get his shot off being as he was as slow as he was. Mm -hmm. And so, and he would he told Charles that the things that he knew he couldn't do, because mm -hmm. he said he knew he couldn't jump and he knew his lateral movement wasn't the quickest. Mm -hmm. He would take film before a game and he'd watch him. Like for hours, just sit there and watch what they like to do. And because he knew that he didn't have the same athletic ability they had, he knew certain tricks he could do to get his shot off. So I was, when you were saying about uh, athleticism as opposed to uh, you know, work and yeah, yeah. desire, well, I think I think if you got the ability and you got the, the desire and the, and, the, and the work ethic, they can more than make up for a lack of athleticism. Here's an interesting question. I'll turn back to you, but then I'll answer your question based upon what I know about preparing for, for athletics. Would we ever accept a white, a, a black Larry Bird? A black Larry Bird? Yes, yeah, someone who was slow, someone who didn't have the skill, I mean, that who didn't have the flair and athletic ability, I but think still, still very good. You think we have? I think you have. Huh. Okay. I, I give I give you the president name. Okay. Devin Jones. You want you want the MVP? <laughs> Tim Duncan. Okay. Who shot who shot Cole yeah, in a way yeah, the big yeah. fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. He okay. not he won't yeah. he won't jump out of the gym on nobody. Right. But he he's not gonna be real fancy with the yeah. dribble either. Yeah. But he kills people because he knows it's the game. game. Yeah. Here's here's what I would say about the 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 athletic ability and the work the hard work. What you see is that those people who have the ability, who have natural talent, things come easier to them. All right, but still, still, no. I would take. I would guarantee this. Even people make fun of Allen Iverson. He was talking about practice that whole time. He was making that fuss about practice. I would guarantee you that no one works hard, harder than those guys that are in the NBA on their games. You know, you might even take marginal players. Those guys are spending time in the gym, shooting, and working, whatever. So I think what it is is uh, that, that natural ability meets hard work and effort, period, all right? You're not going to make it without those two there. And then the, the, the notion that there's skill and that there's natural athletic ability and talent. Dominique Wilkins is natural athletic uh, ability. Larry Bird is skill that is developed over constant preparation and work. So that, and you know, you would take for granted that Dominique also, but there's a, there's a case that they can be made that those two have to go hand in hand, and the likelihood of being successful without having some in this day and age without having some athletic ability is gone. It, you know that's that's over with because now we're we're importing athletic talent. European talent. These now these are athletic guys, mind you, Ginobili. That guy's athletic, whether we want to say so or not. You know he's athletic. Uh, but we're importing players that, so that's the, that's the nature of the NBA game now, is that we're elevating in this way. We're combining athletic ability and, and, uh, and kind of skill development over time. Um, I'm wondering, uh, high school is such an important time in people's lives. I, I wonder, um, and since you were there for quite a while, you must have, have a lot to say in the other sections of, mm -hmm. of your but uh, about uh, the, the changing meaning of basketball over these uh, over young people's careers from childhood, where presumably you're playing outside at the playground or something like that, then as a teenager on the teams, and then so I, I always wonder. I'm, you exit high school so abruptly, and yeah. so I wonder what that does to how athletes relate to the community and think about themselves. Yeah. And what it, the How good, does change again? yeah. The good and bad thing about it is that by being uh, around, that uh, and you get to see what happens, what the end product becomes, and a lot of guys have aspirations for playing at the next level, mm -hmm. and they will go. E these guys have not even been recruited to play 
And they will go to a school with the belief they will try out for a team and make it. All they have to have is a coach look at them. Mind you, these are guys that I already know where they're thinking about playing, they won't be able to do it. But what happens is a lot of them go somewhere, even if it's some sprinky dink uh, community college, and they get there and they get disappointed by the fact that they didn't make it. But they discover, I can do something else. So it kind of catapults them up, up to that level. Then you have the other guys who are the good players uh, who graduate or receive, shall we say, so you're not getting attendance. Because that's a new thing. Not everybody walking across the cap and gown is you got the diploma. And they end up working, you know, blue collar jobs around the area. Uh, and they become known as that athlete with this talent who didn't do anything. Uh, but not in a negative sense. Because what they're doing is better than what they could have been doing. You know, instead of being on the corner of drugs, Locked up, they're doing something different. So people see them uh, in that regard. Uh, and it's the thing that I find so wonderful about Coach Benson, and I need to write a whole book about him, because uh, he was good for me as a as a black man, uh, is that he would he would keep tabs, hands on. He would always be open to whoever came back. He had players years and years. One guy got shot rolling in a wheelchair, coming to talk to him. He was still relating to him and connected to him so that they have some sense that they continue to achieve, they got the constant encouragement that they don't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And then you have some guys that before it even is all over, they fall off to the side. I said this before, I had three guys, and probably the one that hurt me the most uh, uh, was Curtis. Curtis would come to practice, started smoking weed. Curtis, man, you need to get off that weed, man, stay away from that. He would be at home and get, get rid of practice. We would go get him, bring him to practice. And then one day, because he was also taking written for, you know, focus problems or whatever. And one day, his mother decided she couldn't have him anymore. So she put him out of the house. And he went to live with his aunt. And his aunt lived where? In a drug house. Drug house gets busted. He's locked up. We had invested so much in trying to help him make it. And it didn't work. Then I got, you know, the numbers for us. Guys who bring me for their freshman year, trying to, you know, mold them to the program. And they decide. The street life is better. You know? So that's somewhat frustrating man, to, to be as a coach to see that happen. But I've also taught, I should say this, I should also talk at the university two of my former male players. So now, granted, they were from different backgrounds, it was still good to see them come through that program and then be a part of the university community. Uh, so there's a mixture of reception of, uh, of, of what how they see these players and their, their, their outcomes. My mother used to always say, why would you say something about giving them a scholarship? I used to do campaigns, fill out flyers and send them off to school, just trying to keep the guys' spirits up and see if somebody might take them. Why would you do a campaign and why would you tell them they could be successful athletes if, if you know, they, they're going to fail? Uh, and I said, because they don't really have anything to grasp onto. And she says, well, as long as you have the support system for them when they're done, then it's okay. And because we're there, they can always have access to this. They can always get help. Exactly. Yeah. The irony was that you push that, that the program pushes high hopes for a professional career at Division One, uh -huh. and the irony is that they end up getting supported by. It. Yeah, the, so ir the irony is that this this trick that we play on, this uh -huh. nasty, dirty trick we play, man, you can do it. Come on, you gotta work hard. You got, you can do it. Knowing that this person will never have the physical ability, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. We're telling that lie. And then the irony is that we create a situation where they have mobility. Well, let me uh, suggest uh, what seems to be, uh, first glance, a contradiction between talking at Trina's and this study. And then uh, I'll, I'll propose a way to reconcile it. Okay. See it uh, but it comes out with a different theory about what we find in this basketball scene. So talking at Trina's, this is uh, African Americans at a bar, South Chicago. And they're men, some older men, quite old men, some working men, mm -hmm. uh, middle-aged, uh, some younger guys. And they're talking race and they're talking sex. They're talking descriptive qualities to explain lots of things. Mm -hmm. So if something comes on the TV, Michael Jackson or OJ, you know, it's whatever's happening to them is because of race. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they talk about their infidelities, mm -hmm. and that's because of sex, because men are different. Mm -hmm. 
So here you've got a setting where they're very uh, actively, enthusiastically using ascriptive qualities, race and sex, uh, to make their social life. And, and it's in a hidden place. I mean, as you point out, they don't talk this way when whites are around. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is something they can, they can demean people as black or the way that they're being black among each other. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't do this. Outside. And then you've got a basketball situation where the black guys are 16 and 18, if I remember right, are mm -hmm. not using race where they might to explain basketball achievement. Mm -hmm. But as I recall, the whites, the few whites, they would be more likely to use race. So how do you how do you explain the seeming contradiction? In one setting, it's unattractive for blacks to use race to explain things. In another setting, it's very attractive for blacks to use race to explain things that could be like OJ or whatever, it could be explained by all kinds of other explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the things that, that I that I say is that the young men are in a particular stage in life when race should not matter. That uh, if you compare them to the men in trans, they the men in trans have had an experience of life where race has mattered, and so there's something easy to grasp onto. Uh, you know, the young men uh, from northeast are in that idealistic stage where you know, hey, race should not matter for opportunity, race should not matter for anything else. In fact, they are insulated from interactions with whites, and so they have not yet had their experience has not yet uh, been informed about the different ways that race can play out in your life. I go, to, I go, I go in my housing project, I go to practice with all my black teammates, we ride the bus together, we play a game, we get back in, we come back. The, it's very isolated, so that they have not been exposed, and so that their, their kind of cultural understanding of the rhetorical tools necessary. Right, let me make the next step. Okay, because all right. a contradiction of that is that the whites have also been living in a segregated way, but yet they are more likely to use, and they're the same age, and living in a segregated mm -hmm. southern city, more likely to use race. So here's an alternate explanation that might reconcile. And that is, it, this is kind of a reflexive. That's question. a pure question, by the way. Yes. Because okay. I, don't, I don't know what the whites would do. OK, I thought I had heard, maybe I misheard. I thought I heard that they were more likely to say that, that race, that blacks have some sort of advantage. Oh, I think that's a generally understood concept for yeah. us all. Yeah, yeah, physically, athletically, yes. No, I did say that. Yeah. But I thought you were talking about the high school, the young high school. Yeah. So if you see these, these expressions as ways not uh, fundamentally motivated, not about saying anything about anybody else, but indirectly saying something about yourself mm -hmm. and relating to the other people around you and what you say about yourself, then the blacks on the uh, high school team, mm -hmm. if they say that athletic ability is granted by race, how does that help them? Why, you know, they need to say, I as an individual am going to have some chance at this and it's got to be hard work that will distinguish me. Because if all blacks are, and by virtue of being blacks, great ability, that's not, you know, yeah, that doesn't that's start a course for me. Special, on the exactly. other hand, if there are relatively few whites on the team and they say, you know, blacks have an advantage, then what they're saying about themselves is I'm really special because yeah. I'm broken with the blacks. Yeah. And they, on, the hand, on the other hand, at Trina's, if they're saying that blacks have these injustices done to them, then they're bonding with each other. They're saying to each other, if there are any problems you have that you want to talk about, the, the stage is set. Mm -hmm. This audience is ready to hear you talk about your problems mm -hmm. because, and then we can reveal things about each other and we can bond with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a very receptive audience who wants to hear race being used to explain Michael Jackson's problem, O.J. Simpson's problem, mm -hmm. one of the members in the bar's problem mm -hmm. at work, that they're being asked questions by other people or co-workers, and they say that's because of race. That gives a lead to the others in the bar to bring out race as an explanation so they can reveal things. That makes that a special place, right. makes them a special group. So would you suggest that, uh, in, in speculation, you suggest that it is because of the age of the it's small groups dynamics and it's the social context that they're in at the time and it's the meaning for the individual as to what they're saying about themselves that in a sense is central to them. They, you know, they, they probably change what they say about blacks and whites depending on the circumstances. Yeah. It's not like they had ingrained in them yeah. a whole philosophy of life. What they're basically trying to do is relate to other people at that moment in a way that they feel good yeah. and that says good things about them. If, if I, in fact, probably asked them something specifically about uh, do they think that black professional athletes are more athletic than white professional athletes? 
you probably would have gotten black professional athletes are more athletic because they have a number of cases. But I, I think uh, that's a good point there because uh, the head coach didn't use them as explanations. He would say things like, well, and you know if a black man, and you know if a black man had to deal with this, then that would be added pressure for something. But for the most part, those were outside considerations. And I think that's because there needed to be some level of connection or awareness uh, to have aspirations outside of where you work. And so you needed something to help drive you. And to say that I'm like every other black man, you know, then it's not to say I'm going to be special, I'm going to move beyond where I am. So I think that, I mean, yeah, you could offer Creed said, all right. I, you might have touched on this earlier. What, what high school were you at in Chicago? No, it's not Chicago. Northeast High School in um, in Georgia. Yeah, okay. and it's actually a uh, student. So okay. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to, to touch on because obviously you, you're from a different era where hardship really meant hardship when it comes to uh, athletics, and and at this point we're talking about basketball mm -hmm. because you can't go out in football early. Mm -hmm. How do you feel it has affected African American males with the pseudo hardship that they have now where you can go directly from high school to the NBA if you have the talent without going through the college experience and what do you see as a remedy for some of the problems that have arisen from that in the future? Okay, I, I would say first of all with this particular population these would be players that you would consider run-of-the-mill average players. And that's why I was making the point about the distinction because uh, these are not the elite athletes. They do not play against other elite athletes. And so they get a false understanding of where they place with regard to aspirations, what they can do. And what I will say is that uh, in the state of Georgia, in fact, the University of Georgia just lost uh, a recruit to the NBA who wants to go directly to the NBA. And, and for a lot of these guys, uh, I mean, I'm kind of torn because this is where I see it. If any of us were here working right now, just say graduate student, you're a graduate student, and someone says to you, look, you could have the pie in the sky right now if you didn't have to do a master's paper or a PhD paper or whatever. For some reason, I believe that a lot of people might actually take that opportunity. You can always go back and get that PhD after you have this pie in the sky. That's not anything, that's work you can do later. So in that regard, to be allowed, and we know from, you know, kind of cultural capital things, kind of earning potential things, that the sooner you begin your profession, the more money you can earn over a longer period of time. So it makes logical and rational sense to make that decision if you're capable of doing that. The thing is that these young men, just like we all are, this is, not, this is not just in sports. These young men may be disillusioned about opportunity. They may see it. A lot of guys are walking around and saying, man, I'm going pro. I'm right, right on the cusp of being a pro. They might not even be a McDonald's All-American or Parade all but I'm going pro. And there's some people thinking, well, shit, I'm going to be a hot shot corporate attorney. You know? The F so they may, not, they may not match what's possible. And it's not, no different than any other realm. Uh, you know, people are leaving prematurely to become something they may not become. So in that regards, I don't, I don't see it as problematic. Now in the other regards, uh, and this is one I, I like to talk about, people always say, well, uh, and I'm sure you might have heard this before, you got a better chance of being a brain surgeon than you do than being a professional athlete. You heard that rhetoric before, right? Well, for these guys, shit, it's about the same. You know, where they're coming from. Uh, but at the same time, we have to do creative things uh, for, for young people in general to give them the view that there are multiple things you can do. There are several things you can do. Okay, I wanted you to start off down that road. Yeah. And I'm going to take it the, to the next step. Okay. Having said what you said, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on public commentary when it comes to revenue generating sports like football and basketball where the young people that want to go out into those to earn their career and earn a living are predominantly African American as opposed to baseball, swimming, tennis where they are predominantly white and nothing is really said about them. They're not going to college, they're not doing this and that. Yeah. So you're talking about the rhetoric that, that people kind of uh, 
espouse when a uh, swimmer leaves and goes to training for Olympics. And nothing said about that. I think the perception has a lot to do with, and, and that's, you know, that's legitimate. You know, we don't, <laughs> you can say it about anything. People that leave, they, they play baseball early. They go to the draft and they play baseball early. Uh, you can make that argument. Uh, but that clearly states to me, when you have that kind of rhetoric that's focused on African American or the African American athlete, that there's a racial component to that discussion. Uh, and nothing more. And I don't know if there's a corrective for it or whatever. I've been exposed to a lot of different athletes, you know, uh, in my career in teaching, you know, college athletes and seeing some that leave and go to overseas, go back home because they made the Olympic team and they qualified. I had a guy miss two weeks of school because he qualified, you know, for, for you know, the Olympics. Uh, but I don't know if there's a corrective. That's just in, indicative of people's view, even black Americans' view of what black men should be doing. Uh, without understanding clearly that people take these chances all the time. These are the things that they people do. Can they rebound from it? I think absolutely. It's just the expectation we're supposed to conform to certain kinds of behaviors and make certain kinds of choices. And, you know, the expectation may be racialized, or where uh, in, the, in this particular community, yeah, you should aspire to be a good athlete, a professional athlete. Uh, but it's just indicative to me. So it's not problematic. It just shows me that people think about these things in racialized terms. And they're consistent with these stereotypical views that we have. And then we want to talk about people negatively because they make these choices based upon these stereotypes that we constantly reinforce over and over again. Uh, so I don't know if there's a corrective for it, but that's just more indicative of kind of the situation. Looking at the whole nexus between education, sport, and race, um, did you probe at all from your interview questions into this whole notion of a dumb jock and how this group is actually perceived within the context of the classroom? Uh, that is probably one space that I didn't touch much on. And I will say this, that because of my affiliation uh, with the high school, I was not a teacher there. So the kind of inside workings that go on with education, I have very little uh, kind of perspective on, except to the extent that we get to a crisis situation. A player needs to get a certain grade in the class. Everybody's pouring energy into it. The coach is expending cultural capital to talk to the teacher and getting on a player's ass to do exactly what he's supposed to do. Other than that, it's school is a byproduct, or it's off to the side, it's about the relationships there, and except for when it comes to fighting and someone gets suspended. So, so I have limited connection to understanding. I did ask them about educational aspirations, what they plan to do. And of course, the, the standard line is, I'm, I'm going to go to college, right? What else do you think they, they want to do if they didn't go to college? Professional athlete, but coach. But coach could be one, but this is one that came up all the time. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Good. No, but this is what this is what is consistent with everyone would say. What is the American thing to do? Make money. How? Depends where you my own business. Yeah. My own business. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my own business. Everyone had a conception they would make money by going into their own business. That's the American way to do things. It's, now, I had my own business, and I know those aspirations as, are as faulty <laughs> as other aspirations. If you're undercapitalized, you don't have a good product, you can't mass produce, you can't get cheap labor, then that shit will not work. <laughs> so, I mean, the, 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 okay. <laughs> I just like it. The distinction you make between um, basketball star and brain surgeon, they're mm -hmm. equally unlikely. Mm -hmm. That's racialized, right? I mean, on the one hand, um, these athletes, these student athletes think naively about being a professional athlete. Uh -huh. It would be just as crazy for you to endorse them to go on to a top tier university. Yeah. That's not the tact yeah. you take, yeah. although I assume if they were an immigrant kid, yeah. not doing very well, they might get pushed in that direction. Both of them aren't prepared for where they're going. Yeah. That's racialized and also uh, it's put into a class context. Yeah, that's right. Because clearly, you know, there are so few, and all we need is one to be convinced. There's so few cases of those individuals start the bootstraps theory. They start from the ground and go all the way to where they need to be. He became a surgeon out of great troubles that he fought through as a young man. Shh. Most of the surgeons, their daddies are doctors. Their mamas are doctors. Somebody's got them in education somewhere early on. 
So it's not these, and boy, all we need is one. And we're like, man, you can make it. All we need is one professional basketball player to go from high school to the pros and show off. Hey, I can do that too. Uh, so I think it's racialized, but it's all also very much class oriented. That understanding that you know this person does not have the tools, does not, it's not networked to the people, will not receive the quality resources they need from grade school up to have this kind of success. So they've been disillusioned and uh, disenfranchised, so to speak, from from this whole process by their educational experiences up to that point. Wait, but your argument is that giving them this false hope at least lands them in a college, mm -hmm. which is productive, mm -hmm. right? They, oh, right? okay, yeah, But yeah, yeah. if you send them to be, I'm going to make your own argument, but if you send them to be a brainiac, you know, somewhere where they'll fail mm -hmm. out of college, they're going to leave, and there's no sort of externality that's positive to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, a I, I disagree with that, too, because it doesn't necessarily mean that if they're in that environment that they're not going to succeed. It, may, it might make it harder, but there have been a number of examples where people rise to the occasion, like you said, both academically and athletically. Case in point, we had a, yeah, that's a, a case. Well, there's just one, but there could be several. I mean, I, I disagree with that okay. because I think okay. environment plays a, a big role there. No, I agree with you, but I, what I'm saying is that the access, a person's uh, ability to move through that, I mean, most of us replicate our parents' class status. That's, I mean, that's what I think happens. And that's generational, though. No, Maybe but I, now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my parents didn't do that. Well, immigrants immigrant somehow manage Because, to because they, start, they start here on the ground. Depending on what stream they're from. But yeah. Well, that's true. That all that matters. The point I was going to make was that in order for a person to have aspirations, it's got to be something, A, that they desire, B, that they you know, think they can do. Okay? Every black man believes he can play basketball. And so that creates a desirable aspiration. We don't have enough. We do have a case in point. We can choose as a black surgeon and say, you could be a black surgeon. In fact, one of the point emphasis that William Benson would make is that, look at Dr. May. How many, how many coaching staffs have a doctor on it? You could be a professor. You see, I was used as a model. You know, but I think it has to do with you know, you can have those aspirations, but, I mean, it's got to be something you desire. And everywhere they look and they see, even me, I, I didn't play basketball until I was in college. And my mother said to me when I was going out for the team, son, don't do that. You got better things to do than chase that basketball around the court. But I believed. Shit, I can play. <laughs> and that's what we think about. I, would, I didn't think anything about being, oh, I could be a doctor. Those aspirations are also they're racialized to the extent that we have these conceptions. These are laid out, you know, these are laid out things that we can do. These are things that we're supposed to be able to do. And that's why it comes up in those conversations and that commentary. We need to get away from that. Because those are things that constantly re uh, re ingrain. We had a kid that went in the draft recently from the high school. They recently went in the draft in the top ten, the football draft in the top ten. So you know all the kids that are there are going, sure, I'm gonna be like him. I don't see him saying, okay, we're going to be like, you know, this guy here who became a doctor, this guy here. So, the aspirations on this guy. I, I think this is where at 2 o'clock seems to be some people might like to continue speaking, but okay. we should formally get people who okay. want a chance to go over it. Okay. Well, I appreciate you all. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh,